Hello. Uh, that's iTunes. It's exciting, isn't it? I need to get on with it. I've got lots of pages here. Um, am I speaking loud enough? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the interaction. Now I'm not going to pay any attention to you. Let's go. <laughs> Normally at this point I'd say, oh, well these are the things I'm specifically not talking about in this paper, but not today. <laughs> today I'm going to tell you about what I'm going to do and remark on the fact that this is exactly the same as my abstract, <laughs> other than it not being the same amount of words, because that would be tedious to repeat over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but it is sort of about the word capture, but then I got bored of reading everyone using the word capture all the time, so I'm not going to talk about that as such. The story of field recording is one of discovery and also of replication. Oh yeah. And there's going to be another thing that is in this paper, is um, bits of science mishmash thrown in, which I do kind of mean, but from a mid-range of neither just throwing the words in nor being an expert. You'll see that kind of thing, right? Quantum <laughs> nonsense, right? So, hmm, what is the field? That kind of thing. Field recording comes burdened with stories explaining how field recording represents something that just is. The whatness of the sounds is valorized over the whatness of the recording, of what it is that we actually have when we use or listen to field recording. The ontology of the recording part of field recording has not remained untouched, as musicians, anthropologists, and thinkers rummage for buried vintage treasures in the sonic past, making use of what Nicholas Matthew and uh, Mary Ann Smart term quirk historicism. This term indicates a strong tendency to find illustrative details on a highly selective basis and then expand those slender tales into conceptual modeling tools. A parallel trend could be found in what we might think of as quirk futurism, where something interesting and topical is posited as a harbinger for revolutionary retoolings. My contention here is that the quirk continuum, or field, operates neatly throughout the entire history of field recording, a history that in fact I pay little attention to while seeming to dip in and out of occasionally. <laughs> Probably not gonna play any of these things here. Um, unless you specifically ask me afterwards. And the field recording operates as a progressively stranger device for processing the world the more its assumptions or strategies are brought into entanglement with critical thinking. There are two modes, so you can decide what to do with words like that. <laughs> there are two modes of conceiving the intervention of field recording in the world. The first is about space and time and concerns the object of research, the rare species of moth caught to be preserved forever. The second mode, in nested opposition to the first, is about uh, the process of sound catching. Pierre-Yves Massé writes of phonography as a practice that is isomorphic to photography, i.e. that the recorded material represents an instance of the real. Further, this representation creates or structures the very belief it is trying to inculcate. Phonography is not the actual object brought to the here and now from then and there, a then and there that was the here and now of its moment of capture, Rather, it is the idea of being a real that is presented to us as a thing that was present but now no longer is, just as Barthes claimed in his writings on photography. This idea of the captured real permeates the further use of field recording as marker of the real, an idea prefigured in Schaefer, R. Murray, notion, notes, notion of the sound mark that crystallizes the sonic presence of a given location. Finally, in this model of encapsulating the sonic real, Musicians and sound artists play on the distinction between the musical and non-musical, bringing this deconstruction relation inside of music or art production. Massé emphasizes that uh, music itself is always already the exclusion of what it is not, and this absence has been a permanent uh, non-presence within all music. The advent of field recording as an established practice such that it carries its own signifying codes, it is the carrying of those codes, merely serves to bring this inherent, if retrospectively found, connection to light. If the first mode is one of, the, of thinking about field recording, is of the status of the object, the second is about technologies of object framing. And Jonathan Stern points out the mutual influences of anthropology and nascent recording technologies. As far as field recording is concerned, all early recording can be thought of as being an anthropological field recording of some sort, a way of capturing a reel that could be uh, then relayed in another time and place, thus fixing the fleeting interminable of sound into something suitable for study and appraisal, and beyond this, capturer's control. Ultimately, all recording carries something of this code within it, even if the growth of multi-tracking, editing, and studio techniques introduces different factors into the ontology of sound. 
The material technologies of early recording of, uh, of stories, folk songs, speeches, carry discursive technologies uh, symbiotically. The belief in preservation conducted from the perspective of an informed outsider drives the use of recording and its dissemination under the banner of authenticity. All of this is admirably teased out by Stern in The Audible Past, and also by certain ethno rare ethnomusicologists such as Stephen Feld. But in addition to these knowledge and power dynamics that the two of those bring out is the deeper structure of access to the real through a combination of enhan enhanced and mediated listening and the sense that framing a real event or situation would allow the real to represent itself as it truly is for the wonderment and instruction of potential audiences. So field recording captures an element of a pre-existing soundscape. The sounds it displays are a sampling of a wider population, but the sounds not only stand in for a wider, specific ecosystem, they can be regarded as an entity that exists exactly as it is, as it is now to be heard via cylinder, MP3, tape, vinyl, etc. Both models of what is being approached or what is the thing in field recording combine to set up the field recording as a privileged transport of the real, a real which can be regarded as being brought to life or just as tantalizingly a marker of the real as that which is excluded from the representation in recording. Ultimately, I want to propose a model where the real is actually and actively extruded from the recording such that it becomes the real the recording says it is and in so doing becomes absent just as any real thing does when either caught in its becoming or simply ignored or unknown, even as the unknown. The recording of something real, of matter made material, says Massey, intervenes not as something external, but as something that creates a pattern relation between what it offers as real, some sort of concrete outside, and the processes involved in the accessing of the sound that transports those relations. The idea of the soundscape has always carried a suggestion of self-reflective awareness, this is part two, a parallel to the move to ethnography, away from anthropology. But the self-reflection persists in maintaining the idea of there being a reality that exists out there in the world and that issues of capture are only epistemological or political. Hence the persistence of an idea of purification, of progressive and self-critical advance to finally and correctly bring sounds from an elsewhere to a different place while keeping the sound authentic and flash frozen. This is far from being the only sense in which soundscapes are an improving discipline, liable to induce better listening and then more democratic and ecologically minded social living. Can you see where we're going with this? <laughs> when R. Murray Schaefer <laughs> went and his teams went hunting for the true sound portraits of specified places, whether Vancouver or the exciting trip to Europe that takes the form of 1977's Five Village Soundscapes, uh, that's a full stop there. Anyway. <laughs> Schaefer's idea was that any human habitation would produce an individual sound world that reflected its socius and also its relative connectedness to the natural surroundings of the village. The whole objective project to define locational soundscapes is shot through, I should say objectivist project, is shot through with judgments about what is good and bad sound. Bad sound is generally anything contemporary, but more specifically it is sound that blocks out other sonic events, so it is not what it is as such, about how it functions for listeners that count. <coughs> of course, a further problem is that Schaefer makes the second level judgment on behalf of the inhabitants as to just how much interference something like traffic, for example, actually makes. But the worst thing of all is when the unfortunate locals are so alienated from their sound world, they no longer notice how disruptive it is, he says. <laughs> so much more could be said about the issues of acoustic ecology, imagine that here, but the point of interest for me is about how Schaefer views the problem. That is that the soundscape is in fact not all of the elements that truly occur, but a truth that is buried under instead of laden with extraneous sounds in its inner unfolding. For example, the presence of traffic hinders the soundscape rather than being something that's just a bit loud within it. Not all soundscapes are so picky, or if they are, it is on different grounds. Traffic is boring, running water is always the same, wind is just an indicator of laziness when you did your recording. <laughs> and from Alvin Lussier to, we are piling through the classics here, but this is just a, you make of it what you will. We get the possibility of a space as made of the noise of its existing when recorded in relation to another intervention. From others we get the idea that happy accidents of sound recording are precisely what supply the real. Now, two works struck me here, which I'm going to mention briefly, but not do much with, and they've become deeply connected, uh, even if the rush to attribute uh, emotional content to them has diminished the extent to which their form drives any possible content, speaking as a formalist. 
And those pieces are Stephen Vicello's Sounds, Building and Fading Light, recorded on the 91st floor of the World Trade Center in 99. Uh, the sounds of the building reacting to its environment and all the kind of uh, contingent ways that sound was produced. And William Brzezinski's Disintegration Loops, Volume 1, before it became a money spinner, uh, from, before it was Volume 1, in fact, from 2002. And both have acquired a really predictable particular status connected to the destruction of the World Trade Center. The first of uh, Vitello's piece in direct memorial mode, uh, though released beforehand. The second in connection with Bashinsky's claim of playing the loops while observing the fall of the towers with dust from the towers from across town. So the content for both has become a specific space of melancholy and absence to be filled with a reaction to that absence. Because there is no way back from that baggage, I'm going to just back away from it. What is interesting in the context I'm imposing on it is the, um, the process of how, of how the process of recording becomes the material in both cases. So Vicello's record is a document not of any reel, but of the attempt to sonically uncover a reel, very much like EVP that we heard something of earlier on, only with a different set of beliefs, and that is in the sounding of the world, not that the sounding would come from a spe uh, specified ethereal source. The disintegration loops are likewise a formal practice of melancholy before their over-determination, with the album being the sound of tapes of earlier recordings decaying as they played, the chemical surface peeling away under the friction of the tape heads, which go from being a mode of transport of the living tape to acting as a pole-bearing delivery system to the morgue of the final CD. <laughs> the soundscape here rec recounts the passage of an effectively two-dimensional space encountering the edge of its universe, that's being scraped by a supplementary dimension in the form of a tape head. This scraping of sound world and device to bring the sound world into being as listenable object can be heard in Koji Asano's masterful noise soundscape, Quoted Landscape, from 95. In this full-length CD, microphone uh, directly brushes the object it seeks to record, and so its entire sound world is of the relation device-object. It's very, very noisy. The space sound occurs in for human ears is rejected for an ever- uh, reducing reductive limiting sound of flattening the landscape even as you get closer to its uh, supposed like I was going to use uh, apparent but uh, no, audient uh, reality uh, so the sound of a microphone scrubbing over surfaces makes this piece a rejection of the idea of capturing an aural hyper reality in favor of a low materialist trudge in so doing something like a universal sound is produced the sound of sameness of sonic equality, except where the lumps occur in the sound space-time. So this work is artifact all the way down and knows it. If what we were looking for, and traditionally this is how we like doing papers in sound studies quite a lot, we go, ha-ha, Koji Asano has the right way, those other people are fools. <laughs> well, to some extent, <coughs> yes, you can have that. And now we're carrying on from there. What I do like, following that sequence through to Koji Asano's work, is the idea of ever-increasing proximity to the object the sound emitter, such that the capture of it does not just uh, kill it like a gassed moth, shot dodo, or the 40 or so tasty turtles on the HMS Beagle. It does far more and far less. It sets up an entanglement of object and object, such that no reality can persist in the process of being brought into the realm of existing. And here at home, I played with some equations, but it felt very 60s, so we're cutting those out. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine the thing with... R equals real equals zero, adding zeros together, putting them one from another, zero on this side, zero on the other, uh, is a one of zero-ness. Might as well have given you the equation now, I told you everything. <laughs> <laughs> Go away and make it yourselves. Good luck with that. The production of nothing out of reaching into nothing, because these objects are both uh, nothing and relate to each other through their nothingness, you'll have to take more reference, you don't have the equation, is not simply nihilistic. <laughs> Instead, it produces stuff as residue, the something that is the sign of the nothing that is the real having not happened. And where this all happens, as if it were real is in the shortening of the distance between real and recording, such that both are acknowledged or brought into being just as the addition of Lucier's voice in a room, then subtracted, leaves the room as residue. It's not the room as sound engineering tech fans would have it, it's the sound of the room as residue, having gone through a process of becoming its realness as nothing. I feel a riff coming on and backing away. Where all this happens, I think, is in the endless approaching, uh, we can see this process in the ever uh, increasing the proximity to this uh, real world uh, that includes its observer consciously. Now, three. Others have taken different routes in their quest. I might be ahead of time at this, right? 
<laughs> I was <have> taking <laughs> different routes. That's not true. In their quest to solve the mystery of the real in audio form, and ostensibly offer more critical parts or guidance into the wilderness of the sonic pleroma. <laughs> Francisco Lopez takes a very broad view of what a soundscape can or should have, arguing that there is, quote, no purposeful a priori distinction of foreground background. He has no problem with selectivity, editing, mixing, or montage, and in his very confused article, Environmental Sound Matter, he claims both that the process of recording is an inevitable mold for the listening or processing of place, and that recordings cannot replace the real experience, and that people have told him how realistic his doctored recordings are, and that he is unrealistic, and, most interestingly, that partial hearing is the natural norm. That's pages one, two, four, four, and five. <laughs> Lopez tries to cover every possible critical angle, purifying his own mission. Um, and every statement relates back to an admittedly complex idea of authenticity that both leaves the real intact as a thing pre-existing, uh, really, in order to be recorded in the best way possible so as to come close, but definitively, essentially fail, uh, thereby maintaining the sense of a real from which sound would have emerged, and we're kind of just making all these attempts to get there. Through the, through the form of the and. Uh, Lopez's real is revealed as absent in recording, yet hyper really present as a trace in the recording is the negative theology of field recording where some kind of God has withdrawn. I don't really want to complain about his idea, only the way he's sort of thrown them all together. On the other hand, if we treat Lopez's ideas as additive rather than forming a coherent narrative, that will begin to show us a more useful way of seeing how field recording relates to the or our real even as it claims not to, or claims to only fail to capture. So, the work that, a quick run through of a list here, the work that Lopez produces alongside these notes is subtitled Sound Environments from a Neotropical Rainforest. But there are other attempts to recognize the complete embeddedness of the sonic bounty hunter. So this is the other, the improved way of improving your access to the field through your recording, is to make yourself present as an audible kind of, uh, personality, I suppose. Stephen Feld, uh, Stephen Feld has his paranoid critical shields around his recording of, quote, Pygmy Music in Papua New Guinea. That's one method. Andrea Poli's Sonic Antarctica, Heike Vesta's Marine Mammals and Fish of Lofoten and Vester Island, or Heinz Schur's Two Weeks in Alert Bay are three further examples. Let's have a little bit of Andrea Poli in the Antarctic. And each time, more and more, uh, these pieces are more and more revealing of a self-reflection that seeks to hear itself creeping ever closer and talking to some kind of audio camera. Uh, Feld's Voices of the Rainforest is the corrective to the dominant sound gatherer and subaltern object people uh, dynamic and incorporates many aspects of life in Papua New Guinea, including natural sound, music, voices, and quote, evokes 24 hours. This isn't him, this is High and Sure uh, in Alert Bay uh, on the West Coast. Um, evokes 24 hours in the life of Basavi, a particular village, in one continuous hour. That he has basically shoved the Kaluli people back into being part of nature does not seem to concern him. I complain more at him in other work, so I'll <laughs> leave that there for the moment. Um, in the uh, Antarctic piece, and these couple of things I have here, all on the Grun recorder label, there's a kind of, there seems to be a sort of policy where there is no such hierarchy as what we're dealing with is a very different kind of community setting. So in the case of the Antarctic recordings, the uh, Sonic Antarctica, where the community is a shared, a kind of, very uh, homogenous in a way, scientific research elite, and it's heard interacting with its surroundings, and all of that, plus the presence of the recorder, is in place. Similarly, a Heike Vesta's uh, Marine Mammals one. Heinz Shaw is really uh, involved in this. Uh, he's released this big thing, the Box of Treasures, and that's here. The How Raven Stole the Sun. 
Yeah. So there he is on his recording, joining in and reading a story from the uh, people that he finds on his travels. His box of treasures, he called it, with its lengthy hedging of the two weeks in Alert Bay, also gives, gives us the hope that a good, honest, what Rorty would have called uh, theory hope, we can have field recording hope, I guess, <laughs> that a good, honest, respectful and true portrait can emerge from a lengthy engagement that can be distilled for aesthetic and ponderously ethical listening. The whole, in Heinz Schur's case, is reframed as a journey, with track one the sound of an arriving boat, presumably Schur laden, and then the rest of the CD moves from conversations, storytelling, sounds of the location, whether of the village or further beyond. And once more, in all these cases, the final setting or montage illustrates the web of interactions in a place as well as the recorder's perception, knowledge, and aural mastery in the form of the finalized recording. All of these examples look for a true listening that hints at a real event or place that is specifically absent, but otherwise present at some other time. And they do so through a conscious use of what would be regarded as artifacts, the ironic name given to errors in coding that produce unexpected sonic moments, particularly while editing. And in these sonic ethnographies, or ethnophonographies, those artifacts are not exclusively digital. Stern, for example, refers to early recording of uh, Native American song by ethnographers as artifacts in a sort of premonition of this idea. But they do arise presumably as a result of, uh, I have written down transversal digitality, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Pierre Yves Massé, on his opening page of his book, says, I'm using the word transversal because I know what it means. <laughs> I'm with him on that. And I apologise for its presence. It's just looking in something. It's fine, there it is. That is, through an interaction of ostensibly analogue and digital in the processing of air disturbance. The choice to keep these moments in is an act of digital selection, of closing down the cut between analogue and digital, transversal, and allowing the creation of a purposeful artefact that microcosmically works the same way as the recording as a whole. So you heard a tiny bit of that on the Glacier recording a second ago. It's a way to kind of retool the hermetic model. Uh, so rethinking the microcosmic, uh, microcosm, macrocosm, that stuff. Once the artifact has been accepted as part of the real and part of the recording, and is not an error in the transcription of the world, if it is an error, it is only in the world as transcription already, resulting from the interaction of different processes or forces and then in that case, the artifact becomes a possible paradigm for the field as a whole, or at least a glimpse into a new kind of field. Now, this field is no longer the place in which recording happens, thus revealing the referent in the referentiality of the sound there captured. The moment field recording enters the field, it structures the field as a recursive product of its own activity. If there was a real there, safe from categorization as referent, it is displaced by a new relational pattern which emanates from the recording, or even the decision to record. This is not to make the field a simple product of the recording. Rather, the field expands to encompass what was called the field, the place of recording, its presence as sound within the recording, its absence as real, also within the recording, its absence as place to the displaced listener, who is both far from the actual place and made aware of this in the listening, to the place that is other to his or her other place of listening. That's leaving aside what happens when the CD is just sat there unlistened. <laughs> uh, which interested me for too long, so I decided not to say anything about that. These different types of real, different types of place, form a new field of processes and wave-like interactions, perhaps easier to understand than a set of constantly deconstructing apparatic crossroads, uh, which is how I first thought of them. But that, yeah, I got lost there. The reason, not now, I got <laughs> lost there when I was first. <laughs> I'm not exactly where I am, and I'm not at the apparatic crossroads. I'm in this kind of field space. <laughs> I don't know whether you are, but that's where I am. So you're stuck with me telling you about it for a little moment more. The reason we can talk of this expanded field is not just the interjection of a deconstructive model or the gemming in of a kind of Baudrillardian purism or nihilistic realism, or nihilist realism, sorry, but due to a recognition of the strange effect that producing the real in sound has, such that it sets off in different unpredictable directions once activated. The sonic artifact is the structure of field recording as expanded relational field, a way of thinking the contingent and multiple instantiations of the real as occasional, fleeting, and withheld, even as offered for consumption, encounter, comprehension, uh, effective encounter, whatever, some kind of encounter. The artifact can also be conceived of as the observer, as produced by what seems to be his or her, her own action of observing, or more accurately, the observer is artifactually located, uh, not in the use of extraneous technology, but being located as artifactual. Uh, kind of like uh, Boltzmann brains. 
I don't want to say anything more about that. Um, a non-human observer existing only fleetingly to bring an observation into being uh, such that a real seems to have always existed and you have a, someone to perceive that observation afterwards. That's me not saying anything about it. Quite pleased with that. <laughs> and so you'd be artifactually subject just as the field is artifactually created and that is a part of the functioning of this sort of uh, wave field or however you want to think about it uh, once I've gone away. Does all of that leave the process of recording as the only non-artifactual thing? Well, no, because that too becomes nothing once all the other nothings have been brought into existence. Uh, but it's a nothing that is specifically the arrangement of connections, locations, and movements in audio spatial, audio temporal, uh, hypersound. Why not? And I mean it. I don't just mean, oh, I call it hypersound. The place where sound is only a potential of all possible events, all possible sound, all possible recording activity, all possible listening. And yet somehow all those nothings produce a thing which is also nothing in a set of relational nothings in a field of F. 